too many of us, we are quick to point out the flaws. We are quick to point out the blemishes of others. But we won't turn around, look in the mirror, and point out our flaws. We won't turn around and look in the mirror and point out our imperfections. We are quick to get on somebody else in their downfalls and their imperfections, but we won't say a word about our downfalls, our missteps, our imperfections. We must be conscious whether or not we are moving with and out of sincere love today. The reason why that is, is because the way that we conduct ourselves, it speaks of us. Not only does it speak of us, but it also speaks of the Lord. And at the same time, it speaks of our faith in the Lord as well. So we must be conscious of how we are conducting ourselves by how we live in this world today. You see, too often I feel like we as believers, I feel like we don't understand that there is a consequence. I feel like we don't understand that there are consequences, both good and bad, to how we conduct ourselves in this world. What I mean by this is that had Paul and his companions, had they conducted themselves that was not of godly sincerity, they would have turned the Corinthians away from the Lord. They would have turned many people away from the Lord. Yet because they conducted themselves with godly sincerity, they won over many hearts of the Corinthian people. In other words, they turned many people to the Lord because they conducted themselves holy and righteously. They conduct themselves with godly sincerity. So we must ask and we must answer the question today. What does the testimony of your conscience, what does it say about you? We must answer today whether or not we are conducting ourselves out of sincere faith out of godly sincerity. Are you, in other words, are you living honorably in the world today? Are you living in all honesty? Are you living in all truth in our world today? Or are you acting maliciously? Are you being a schemer in our world today? How are you conducting yourself in our world today? You see, I ask these questions because, again, we must be conscious that we carry ourselves as believers. We must be conscious that we are carrying ourselves with and out of godly sincerity. Are you doing that today? So where does one begin to do this? Where does one begin in order to move in godly sincerity today? As Paul said there again in our key verse for today, our love, it must be without hypocrisy. That word there, hypocrisy, that is speaking and saying that our conduct, again, it must not be contradictory. It, our love, it must be without behavior that contradicts itself. Our love, in other words, it must be truthful. Is your love truthful today? Mm -hmm. So as many of us would say, our conduct, it must be real. We must keep it real in the world today. Now, some of us, we will hear, hey, yeah, you got to keep it real. And we'll say, oh, I can do that, man. I, I keep it real all the time, preacher. Some will say, I keep it a hundred. I, I, I keep it real all the time, preacher. I ain't got no problem with that. I can, I can keep it real with anybody. But I say to you today that in order for you to keep it real with others, you have to first keep it real with yourself. If you are going to move with sincerity, if you're going to move out of godly sincerity, you better keep it real with yourself. You better be sin 
sincere with yourself. You see, how can we move in sincerity? How can we keep it real with others if we ain't keeping it real with ourselves? How can you keep it real with others if you turn around, you look in the mirror, and you lie to yourself? Now, I want to share with you all a story about the Pharisees again today. We, we've already taken a look at the Pharisees in our Sunday school lesson, but they pop up again today. You, you see, keeping it real with themselves, it was a major issue that the Pharisees had. Uh, again, I want to show you here that the Pharisees, they struggled with being and keeping it truthful with themselves. And in them not being able to keep it truthful with themselves, they not only hurt themselves, but they hurt all those that were around them. Mm -hmm. So I want to take another look at those old Pharisees in today's message so that we don't end up taking the same road that they took. We want to keep it real. We want to move with sincere faith. We want to move out of sincere faith with all of those that are around us. So we'll take a look here at the Pharisees today. Now, as recorded in the 18th chapter of Luke's gospel, you can turn over to the 18th chapter of Luke's gospel if you want to. We'll see from the 9th through the 14th verse in the 18th chapter of Luke's gospel that Jesus, he shared a parable about two men that went to the temple to pray. We're told there in the 10th verse, if you're taking a look at it, we're told there that one of the men that went to pray was a Pharisee. And we're told that the other that went to pray was a tax collector. Now, in that culture, the Pharisee, the religious leader, would have been honored, would have been one that was considered to be highly regarded because he was a religious leader. Whereas the tax collector would have been looked down upon because he was just a tax collector. They didn't have any regard for the tax collector. You know, if somebody come to you and say, hey, it's time for you to pay your taxes. You know how we get when it's tax season. We ain't got time for taxes. We don't want anything to do with them. Now, we'll see that the two men, they began to pray. And in the 11th verse, we'll see the Pharisee prayer. And in his prayer, the Pharisee gave thanks to God. But look what the Pharisee gives thanks for here. The Pharisee gave thanks to God because he wasn't like extortioners. He wasn't like unjust adulterers. And then there, he says that he gave thanks. He said that he gave thanks because he wasn't like the tax collector who was there in the temple to pray. What's so bad about that? The tax collector had come to the temple to pray. But this Pharisee, we talked about how the Pharisees felt like they was entitled in our Sunday school lesson today. This Pharisee turned around and said, oh, there go that tax collector over there. Man, I'm better than him. Thank you, God. That I ain't like that guy. That's what he prayed about in his prayer. The Pharisee, we will then see there, the Pharisee then applied it himself. The Pharisee in his prayer, he applied it how he had fasted twice a week. Hey, I fast twice a week, Lord. Then the Pharisee there will see uh, he applied it himself because he gave his tithes, gave his tithes and his offerings. This, this religious leader, this religious man, he was going down his checklist, wasn't he? He was going down his list as to why he was good. Y'all wasn't looking, but I used air quotes on that good there. Y'all know what that means. You see, this man, he was, he was righteous, but he was self-righteous. He was righteous in his own mind. You see, no righteous man would have prayed that prayer. I'm telling you that right now. No righteous man would have dared pray that prayer to the Lord. No righteous man would have had the audacity to say those things to God. 
Why? Because that the righteous man would have honored the Lord in their prayer. And that wasn't no prayer of honor, was it? But then there's the tax collector that was off to himself and was praying. I don't even think the tax, uh, the tax collector even heard what the, the Pharisee had done said about him. And I don't think the tax collector even cared. The tax collector, on the other hand, we'll see was humble when he prayed. In the 13th verse, we're told that in his prayer, that the tax collector, that he acknowledged a very harsh truth about himself. The tax collector, he said to the Lord that he was a sinner. In other words, the tax collector was saying that there wasn't anything good about him to the Lord. And in acknowledging that he was a sinner, the tax collector will see, pray to the Lord for God to be merciful to him because he was a sinner. He prayed for the Lord's mercy. He prayed for the Lord's forgiveness. Now, I say to all of you, to me, that the prayer of the tax collector is one of the greatest prayers that is recorded in Scripture. In fact, I would tell all of you that the prayer of this tax collector may be one of the greatest prayers that have been prayed in the world today. It wasn't a long prayer. It wasn't a drawn out prayer. It was short. It was concise. It was to the point. That's how prayer is supposed to be. Now, somebody may say, well, preacher, why do you, why are you saying that? Why are you saying that that's the greatest prayer that may be recorded in scripture? Well, well, Jesus, he tells us that this man did something that the Pharisee didn't come close to doing in his prayer. The tax collector, Jesus said, in the 14th verse, went home justified after he had prayed. Well, the Pharisee didn't go home being justified. So what was so special about the tax collector's prayer that, that Jesus loved and bragged about and that I love and brag about today? I'll tell you what it was. It was the sincerity. It was the sincerity of the tax collector's prayer that made it so beautiful, that made it so special. You see, the tax collector, he didn't lie to the Lord about who he was. The, the tax collector, I hope you see it there, he was honest. The, the tax collector, he was truthful. He was truthful to the Lord, but most importantly, the tax collector was truthful to himself. He didn't look in the mirror and lie about who he was. You see, there is a, a great reward from the Lord when we are honest with him. There is a great reward for yourself when you're honest and sincere to yourself. So I want you to understand today that in order for us to move in sincere faith, in order for us to move in love without hypocrisy, we have to first be honest with ourselves. We have to first be honest with ourselves. And, and sadly, I say to all of you today, there ain't enough of that going around in the world today. Too many people are, are, are going to the mirror. They're looking in the mirror and they won't tell the truth about themselves. They won't acknowledge the truth about themselves. They look in the mirror and they put over a mask over their face and they'll say, hey, everything is all right. I look fine today. And then they'll walk out the door wearing that mask instead of actually being truthful with themselves. Too many of us, we are quick to point out the flaws. We are quick to point out the blemishes of others. But we won't turn around, look in the mirror and point out our flaws. We won't turn around and look in the mirror and point out our imperfections. We are quick to get on somebody else in their downfalls and their imperfections, but we won't say a word about our downfalls, our missteps, our imperfections. And I tell you today that if we can't be sincere and honest with ourselves, how in the world could we ever approach 
being sincere and honest with all of those that are around us. If we aren't sincere with ourselves, we won't come close to ever moving with and out of God is sincere. I don't know if you hear me here today. Again, I mentioned to you the Pharisees today when speaking about moving in godly sincerity because they always come to my mind when I start thinking about godly sincerity. Not because they moved out of godly sincerity. They didn't come close to doing it. It's because they set the example that we should not follow. That's why I always focus on them. That's why I always bring them up when I start speaking about loving when I start speaking about being honest, when I start speaking about being truthful, when I start speaking about being genuine in our faith, when I start speaking about being sincere in our faith, I always bring up the Pharisees because they were the total opposite. They are in scripture for us to learn from. As shown here through this parable, this Pharisee could never be sincere with others. And again, the reason why was because how he thought about himself. This Pharisee, he thought very highly of himself. He was righteous in his own eyes. He was living an entitled life. He felt superior than all of those that were around him. Maybe even other Pharisees as well. Never know. See, that Pharisee was like many of the Pharisees in Jesus's day. On multiple occasions, Jesus, he called the Pharisees, these religious leaders, he called them hypocrites. So what was it about them? What was it about the religious leaders, the Pharisees? What was it about them that made them hypocrites? Well, over in the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, we'll see exactly what it was. We'll see exactly why Jesus often called the Pharisees and the religious leaders why he called them hypocrites. If you're looking at the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, go down to the 27th verse there, and you'll see that Jesus, he likened these religious leaders to something that I hope sticks with you today so that you don't be this way. In the 27th verse of the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel, you'll see that Jesus, he likened the Pharisees to being like whitewashed tombs. This is an interesting comparison, and you'll see why here in a moment. You see, Jesus said that they were beautiful on the outside. But look at what Jesus said that they were like on the inside. On the inside, Jesus, he said that they were full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. They look good on the outside, but on the inside, oh boy. Oh, boy, they were, they were dead on the inside. They were a filthy mess on the inside. And when we say on the inside there, we're talking about the heart. When we're talking about the heart, we're talking about the soul. They were dead in their soul. Their soul was a filthy mess. Even though they were the religious leaders, they looked good on the outside, but on the inside they were dead. Are you dead on the inside today? I hope not. How many of us are presenting ourselves as being sincere, as being honest, as being holy, as being righteous on the outside, but on the inside, we are cold and we are dead. How many of us are presenting ourselves that way? Again, how can we ever lift anybody up if on the inside, we are cold and we are dead in our soul. The Pharisees, they were cold and they were dead on the inside. Yet the Pharisees, they believed themselves to be perfect. And Jesus, he called out their conduct as that of a hypocrite. They did not move in sincere faith to those that they served. They didn't move in sincere faith in serving the Lord as well. Then in the 13th verse of that same chapter, Jesus, he accused the Pharisees of shutting up the kingdom of God to these men. 
They shut up the kingdom of God of heaven to all of those that were around them by the way that they conducted themselves. Something that we must understand today is that we as genuine believers, as sincere believers, we can either open or we can shut up the kingdom of heaven to all of those that are around us. We can either open heaven's doors to them or we can close heaven's doors to them by the way that we conduct ourselves. Instead of moving in sincere faith to uplift the people, we're told that in the fourth verse of the same chapter of Matthew's gospel, we're told that the Pharisees, that they weighed people down with burdens that were too hard for the people to bear. They were supposed to be the men that was lifting up people, but they were pressing down on people. The Pharisees, they had a habit that many share in with today. They tried to force people to live by the law when they themselves didn't obey God's instructions. They didn't live by the law. But they thought that it was all right for them to go around and jab and poke their fingers in somebody's chest and say, hey, you're not being obedient to the law. Well, what was your obedience? Well, they should have been setting the example of heavenly conduct. Their example of godly sincerity, it actually shut up the kingdom of heaven from all of those that were around them. It took for the Lord to give his only begotten son to open back up the doors. That is why God gave the world his only begotten son, because those who are supposed to be his stewards were closing the gates of heaven from the people. Now, Jesus, he continued to paint the picture of the Pharisees' godly sincerity there in the 23rd and the 24th verse of the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel. We'll see that in those two verses that of the Pharisees, Jesus said that they had a habit of getting hung up on the little things. They were hung up on things like the giving of the tithes and offerings. Yet when it came to the weightier matters, Jesus said there, when it came to the weightier matters of the law, the matters of justice, the matters of mercy and faith, Jesus, he said that the Pharisees, they were nowhere to be seen or heard from. Yet they were supposed to be moving in sincere faith. At that point, I tell you today, if they were nowhere to be seen when it came to, again, the weightier matters of the law, when it came to justice, when it came to mercy and faith, I tell you today that they weren't being sincere to their calling. They weren't being sincere to their calling. They weren't being sincere to God's instructions and they weren't being sincere to the people. They weren't even being sincere to themselves. Consider again what the Lord has always called on mankind to do. God, he has always called on us to be obedient to him. And he's always called on us to love each other. He has always called on us to respect one another. But even more importantly, God has called on us to honor each other as well. Like I said last week, there's a difference between honor and respect. According to the law, the children of Israel, they were commanded to love one another. They weren't commanded to love money. They weren't commanded to love wealth. They weren't commanded to love riches, but they showed up was going around acting like they were given that command from God. God hasn't told anybody to do that. God hasn't commanded you to go out in the grind and the hustle for money. That's man's command. The only thing that the Lord has ever asked of anybody was to love him and then to love the neighbor. The children of Israel, they were supposed to move in sincere faith. They were supposed to look out for each other. But the Pharisees, they couldn't be bothered to do that. 
They couldn't even lift a finger to do that. The Pharisees, they desired to be praised. They desired to be glorified by men, but they couldn't even be bothered to extend a helping hand out to those that they wanted to glorify them. They couldn't even extend out their finger to give to the one that they wanted to praise them. You and I, we must learn to truly do right by others. We cannot be like those religious leaders, especially when we say that we are a child of God. We cannot be like those religious leaders. We are leaders of faith today. And we cannot conduct ourselves in the same manner that the Pharisees conducted themselves. You and I, we must learn to truly do right by others. We must not shut up the kingdom of heaven from all of those that are around us. We must open up the kingdom of heaven to all of those that are around us. In order for us to truly move with sincere faith, again, we must be like the tax collector today. Again, I say to you today that we must be willing to acknowledge our flaws. We must be willing to acknowledge our imperfections. We must learn to be brutally honest with ourselves. Can you be brutally honest with yourself today? You see, Jesus, he shared this story because of the self-righteous conduct that some displayed, as we're told in the 18th chapter of Luke's gospel in the ninth verse. In their conduct, some they began to look down on, they began to despise others. People like this Pharisee believe themselves to be perfect when the truth of the matter is that nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. You see, all of us, even myself as the pastor, we all have blemishes. We all have flaws. We all have imperfections. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote that those who deceive themselves by believing they are wise, by believing that they are perfect in this age, Paul said that they should become a fool so that they can then become wise. You see, we must all understand that there's always room for us to grow. Again, ain't nobody perfect. That's the first thing, that's the first truth we must learn to admit to ourselves. There is always room for us to grow. There's always room for us to be better. There's always room for us to improve. See, something that me and my brother, we've been talking about it a lot though, over the past few days is the fact that, again, we must admit our flaws. We must, again, admit our imperfections. Again, we must be willing to acknowledge our downfalls. We must be willing to acknowledge that we ain't perfect. We, we must be willing to acknowledge these things in order for us to mature. In order for us, in other words, to grow up. See, too many of us, we still have a middle school mindset. Too many of us have an elementary school mindset to where we won't acknowledge truths about ourselves. Too many of us, we have a high school mindset to truly and genuinely believe that we are always in the right, that we are always perfect, when in actuality, we are far from it. You see, we must be willing to acknowledge our flaws in order for us to grow up, in order for us to mature. You see, we shouldn't be the person that we was yesterday. We shouldn't be who we uh, was at the start of this year today. You see, tomorrow we should be better than we are today. You see, we should be better today than we were decades ago. Yeah, we should always be improving. We should always be growing. And the only way for us to do that is for us to first be sincere with ourselves. You see, the world, it teaches us to recognize our flaws and the world will tell us, hey, there ain't nothing wrong with your flaws. Accept them. That's what the world will tell us. Accept our imperfections. Now, I understand there are some imperfections that we may have physically that we may not be able to do anything about. 
So I can certainly understand the world speaking to that. But spiritually speaking, things don't work this way. You see, spiritually speaking, I want you to understand today that we cannot accept our flaws and our imperfections spiritually. We cannot accept that we are a sinner and then just simply keep on living being a sinner. You see, there ain't nothing beautiful about being a sinner. There ain't nothing beautiful about being cold and dead on the inside. You better do something about your soul when you come to realize that your soul is in terrible condition. You see, we must recognize our spiritual flaws. We must recognize our imperfections spiritually, and then we must work to correct them. Are you correcting your flaws spiritually today? So you and I, again, we must make corrections. We, we must mature spiritually so that we can become and be a better person. I am of the belief that one of our goals in life should be this, that we become a better person tomorrow than we are today. When we realize this, and then when we do as the tax collector did, I tell you today that we set ourselves up to be blessed by the Lord. Not only do we set ourselves up to be blessed by the Lord, but we set ourselves up to be a blessing to somebody somewhere. We set ourselves up to be a vessel of God. We set ourselves up to be used by the Lord. And that's something that all of us as believers should desire. That is to be used by the Lord, to be used for his holy and for his righteous calling. In the Gospels, Jesus, he spoke about moving in sincere faith. When he said to the disciples in his sermon on the Mount, he said, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. You see, Sincere faith, it continues forward after we acknowledge the truths about ourselves. It moves forward with us being able to actually judge properly. There are many believers that will read those verses from Matthew's gospel about judging, and they'll come away believing that God doesn't want us to judge ever. That we ought not ever judge anybody. Yet that thought, it actually makes no sense when you consider the fact that We have to make judgments in our life, don't we? Now, think about that for a moment. One of the definitions of to judge, it means for us to be able to determine. It means for us to be able to make decisions. And I feel like we do that on a daily basis. I feel like we do that every second, every minute of the day. To where we have to discern and we have to make decisions. So when it comes to judging, we look at that scripture. We have to understand that that other definition of judging. There's another definition of to to judge. And that definition is to speak of condemnation, condemning others. And Jesus was speaking about not condemning each other. When we look at the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, you see, We are not to condemn someone's inward motives because, well, we don't have that authority. We don't really know what people are thinking about in their soul. However, we certainly are able to discern good and evil actions, aren't we? Let's remember that Jesus said that we can tell the difference between a false and a sincere prophet. And we can tell the difference by their fruits that they bear. That is, again, by their actions. Sincere faith, it does not tolerate injustice, nor does it tolerate oppression. Sincere faith, it weighs the weightier matters of the word of God, and it stands in the name of justice. It stands in the name of mercy. It stands in the name of faith. Sincere faith, it moves sympathetically. It moves not to burden others, but to help others that are around us. It moves to help a brother. Sincere faith, it moves to help a sister. 
especially when they have fallen down and are in need of help. See, Jesus said that when we first remove the speck from our own eyes, we're then able to help our brothers. We're then able to help our sisters with removing the speck from their eyes as well. Now, in Paul's letter to the church in Rome, we'll see there back in our scripture in the 12th chapter of Romans. We'll see there in the 10th verse that Paul wrote that sincere faith is affectionate with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Again, Paul, he said there that sincere faith is affectionate with brother love in honor giving preference to one another. Sincere faith, it moves affectionately. And not out of despisement. Sincere faith, it does not move out of hatred. It moves affectionately. To, to be affectionate is to be fond. So to move with affection is to move with fondness, to move with tenderness, to move with a caring attachment, to move with a warm regard. Your, your soul cannot be cold. Your soul, it should be warm. Well, the Pharisee was cold and dead on the inside. We as sincere believers, we are to be warm hearted. Are you warm hearted today? The Pharisee in Jesus' parable he had an air of superiority and it got him nowhere with the Lord. As Jesus said, he didn't go back home justified. Think about that for a moment. As we have learned before, we as sincere believers, we should learn to be humble. We should learn to be humble as we are to be meek. We are to be lowly. We are to be just like Christ. In our walk of faith, Christ didn't walk around here in superiority, did he? We'll notice in this passage of scripture here in the 12th chapter of Romans that to the church in Rome, that Paul, he echoed Jesus's teachings there when he spoke about the conduct of the believer. Paul wrote there in the 14th verse, he wrote that in godly sincerity, the believer should bless those who persecute them. We should not curse our persecutors, Paul said. Paul, he continued on there in the 15th verse, that in godly sincerity, we should rejoice with those who rejoice, and we should weep with those who weep. Now, to be clear about that, we ought not ever be jealous of the blessings that others receive. When they rejoice, we should be rejoicing with them. When somebody is suffering, when somebody is hurting, we should be going, yay, 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 yay. We should be comforting them. We should be consoling them because that's what God has done for us. When we was at our worst, the Lord said that his grace is sufficient for us. He comforted us. He consoled us. Why can't we do the same? And we say that we were moving in sincere faith, but we sit here and we apply when somebody else fall down. That ain't Christ-like, if you ask me. You see, there is way too much of this going on in our world today. Jealousy over the blessings that others receive. Celebration when someone falls down. There is way too much of that going on within the church today. What is going on? Paul wrote that sincere faith does not answer hate with hate. He said there in the 17th verse that sincere faith, it has a regard for good things in the sight of all men. And in the 18th verse, and one of my favorite verses that you find in scripture, Paul tells us that those who live in godly sincerity, that we will should, that we will find a way to live peaceably with all men. Are you finding a way to live peaceably with all of those that are around you? See, those who move in sincere faith, we don't stir up a bunch of mess. Mm -hmm. At least we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be stirring up a bunch of mess. As sincere believers, 
we must leave sin behind us. We must leave that mess, keeping up a bunch of mess. We should leave all of that behind us and we should learn to turn all of our bitterness, those emotions when they creep up, we should learn to turn all of that over to the Lord. You and I, we must remember that the Lord has said that vengeance, it belongs to him and that he will repay it. We should remember that when we live in this manner of sincerity, we learn, we learn to live honorably. We learn to live in a manner that will honor all of those that are around us. We learn to live in a manner that moves in godly sincerity. When this manner of honor is shown to another it can grow. It can grow and it can spread, not just in the world today, that sincerity, it can grow and it can spread for generations after generations. As Paul mentioned in his letter to Timothy, the young preacher, he was, Timothy, he was strong in sincere faith. He was strong in the sincere faith that was shown to him first by his grandmother and by his mother. It passed down to him. And Timothy, he passed it on to others. I look out at our society today and I see a society that is sorely missing sincerity because sincerity is somewhere along the way, it stopped being passed down. And what began to be passed down was bitterness. What began to be passed on was hatred. And we live in a society today that continues to hate, answer hate with hatred of its own and look where it has gotten us. Sadly, our society is filled with great bitterness because we collectively, all we have done is sown seed of just that, bitterness, rather than seeds of sincerity. But what if we decided to do something differently? What if we actually decided to sow seeds of sincerity? Guess what that could do for us? I tell you today, now is the time for us to sow those seeds. Now is the time for us to sow seeds of sincerity in our world today. When we honor others with godly sincerity, we will honor the Lord. And again, when we honor the Lord, the Lord will bless not just us, but he'll bless and he will again regard others highly. They'll be highly favored in his eyes. All of us will be. So again, I encourage all of us today, move with godly sincerity. Amen. 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 Amen.